Good morning. Good morning. Let us give thanks for all blessings, those received and those forthcoming. Welcome everyone to the Middlebury Congregational Church, those here and those joining us over the live stream on this, the second Sunday after Epiphany. Are there any announcements to be made? If there are no more announcements, then let us please prepare ourselves for worship with the musical introit, We Shall Live in Peace Someday. Not today. Not today. Okay. <laughs> we shall live in peace someday. <laughs> what would you like, sir? It's not this Okay. There's no yeah, go for it. Okay. Sing one verse. I mean, if you want to. Want to sing one verse?
Thank you, Dave. Let us now continue with the call to worship, which we find inside the first page of your bulletin and which we read responsibly. It's based on Psalm chapter 36, verses 5 and 7 through 9. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. and you give them drink from the river of your delights. We have changed the gathering hymn to number 228, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, in the Pilgrim Hymnal. Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, 228. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Eternal God, your Son, Jesus Christ, now exalted as Lord of all, pours out his gifts on the church. Grant us that unity which your Spirit gives. Keep us in the bond of peace and bring all creation to worship before your throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are people born of water and spirit. We have made promises to be Christ's faithful disciples and to show his love to our life's end. Although we fail to fulfill these baptismal vows, God's faithful love endures forever. 
Confident in God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and one another, first together in our unison confession, and then individually in silence. Almighty God, we confess that we have been led astray by the idols of our world. We have depended on possessions and have not placed our trust in your grace. We have carelessly consumed the gifts you offer and have failed to be faithful stewards of the earth's resources. We have sought security in earthly things rather than in the strength of your Holy Spirit. Forgive us, we pray. Lead us to true repentance that we may serve you faithfully. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. All the promises of God find their yes in Christ. That's why we utter the amen through him to the glory of God. It is God who has put his seal upon us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. In Christ, by the power of the spirit, we are redeemed and forgiven. Amen. amen. You may be seated. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and sought your will. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So our Old Testament reading is from the book of Judges, and Judges has a cyclical structure where people fall away from following God, and then they're attacked by enemies, and then they cry out for God for help, and they repent of following other gods, and God save, saves them, and that's kind of the cycle. And uh, this section is one of those cycles where the people put away their idols, and then God delivers them. So the Israelites cried to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you because we have abandoned our God and have worshipped the Baals. And the Lord said to the Israelites, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and the Amorites, from the Ammonites and the Philistines, the Sidonians and the Amalekites and the Maonites oppressed you, and you cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand? Yet you have abandoned me and worshipped other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. And the Israelites said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you, but deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and worshiped the Lord, and he could no longer bear to see Israel suffer. And our New Testament reading is from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. And I'll talk more about the context of this in the sermon. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, 
but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each individually, just as the Spirit chooses. Here ends the reading. So last week, we talked a lot about baptism. But one aspect of baptism I didn't mention very much was the role of the Holy Spirit. And one of the traditional things baptism does is give people the Holy Spirit. Through our baptisms, the Holy Spirit, and therefore God, dwells within each one of us. And that's a fairly universal understanding of baptism among churches. Now, sometimes the Spirit doesn't get as much airtime in the church compared to the Father or the Son, and I'm probably guilty of contributing to that. We trot the Spirit out on Pentecost and then not much the rest of the year. But despite often playing third fiddle in the church, the Holy Spirit is really important for the journey of faith. The Holy Spirit dwells within us and sanctifies us. To say that another way, the Holy Spirit helps us grow in Christian love and become more and more like Christ. God is at work in us and helps us to become the people we're called to be, to help us mature as our call, in our calling as Christians. In this sense, the Holy Spirit can be thought of kind of like our conscience. It helps point us in the way we should go and strengthens us to live as a people of faith and reflect Christ in the world. Now to slightly complicate things, in some places in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit doesn't wait around for baptism in order to show up. And this is just one example. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The Jewish circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on even the Gentile uncircumcised. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So all that's to say is sometimes the church needs to play catch up to what God has already done. And that not being baptized doesn't mean we don't have the Holy Spirit in us. Just as baptism can be the giving of the Holy Spirit, it can also be the recognition of what the Spirit has already done. In our New Testament lesson, it seems the Holy Spirit was doing quite a lot for the, the first church of Corinth. But despite that, they were actually having a fight about what the Holy Spirit was doing. So Paul writes to the church to guide them. And Paul's letters to the church to churches are in a lot of ways the records we have of the greatest hits of first century church fights. And the church in Corinth had a number of fights going on. They're fighting about communion, whether you can eat food sacrificed to idols, whether it's better to be baptized by this person or that person, which spiritual gift is the best, and so on. What nearly all of these different fights have in common is that they're all fights about status. Who is the most important? Who is the most special? Who's the best? And it seems the people at First Church Corinth were quite competitive, and their life together as church reflected that, and that led to a lot of problems and fights. Now, as an aside, Paul is able to use that competitive impulse for good when in another letter he brings up how other churches have fundraised more for the poor widows than First Church Corinth. And this is, he like attempts to get them to step up to the plate by comparing them to everyone else. And that's the context of the God loves a cheerful giver quote that's on our stewardship campaign. But that's a sermon for a different day. 
some of this fighting about status in Corinth was probably due to growing pains. The church in Corinth had people from all sorts of occupations and parts of the city. There were a number of quite wealthy people and then many much less well-off people. And despite all that diversity, they were all together in this one church and all supposed to be equal. That's a big transition. And one of the worst offenses being committed at the Corinthian church was the wealthy people having communion separate from everyone else. The Lord's Supper is supposed to unite everyone together in Christ rather than separate them by social status. So unity was definitely a work in progress for Corinth. And this tendency to fall into ranking and stratifying people even carried over into spiritual gifts. Now, spiritual gifts are the sorts of abilities the Holy Spirit working in people gives them. And the gifts mentioned in our lesson today are a mix of gifts we regularly see in our lives and some that we don't. There's wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment between spirits, speaking in tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. In other letters, Paul adds additional gifts serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, mercy, pastoring, and administrating. And I know some of you have a number of those gifts mentioned, but if your particular gifts aren't on there, these lists are by no means meant to be exhaustive. So the gift that was causing trouble in Corinth was the speaking in tongues. And there's a great word for speaking in tongues. It's glossolalia, which is super fun to say, and you're now prepared for a very specific trivia situation. So the people with the gift of glossolalia at First Church were going around saying their gift was the best one, the most desirable one, and that they were therefore the most spiritual and most high status people. Now, before I get to how Paul pushes back against that, you might be wondering why some of those gifts mentioned aren't things we see in the church today. Much of mainstream Christianity has understood gifts like glossolalia, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, and miracles to be gifts that were around for that particular time in history for the building up of the church then, and they're now over. In chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, and that's the passage that's always read at weddings about love being patient and kind. But in that passage, Paul says this, love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. So if none of you can perform miracles or speak in tongues, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. So in order to correct people claiming they're more spiritual and better than everyone else, Paul points out that all these gifts originate with God and not with us. God works in and through us, and we aren't the source. And he says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. That claim is actually the most important one in here. Gifts should be used for the common good, for the building up of the church and for others. Spiritual gifts rightly used orient us towards others and helping and serving them. The church isn't served well if people start trusting in themselves and start puffing themselves up at the expense of others. And this trusting in ourselves and in our gifts is a form of idolatry and while we might not be lording our glossolalia skills over everyone, I think we can sometimes fall into the trap of thinking our God-given gifts are something to boast about at the expense of others. We can start putting our faith in ourselves rather than in our God. And actually, clergy can often fall prey to this trap with all our fancy clothes and fancy titles and a weekly captive audience, though mine's a little smaller this week. <laughs> but we must be the most important and the most special. Look at all the awesome things we do. And I'll leave it to your judgment whether that's something I need to work on in my life. But this, uh, this problem of elevating ourselves above 
other people is a problem in, can be a problem in the church or in any setting. Now, in the church, this is a problem because we constrain to thinking the church is about us as individuals or that we save ourselves. If we build ourselves up without building other people up, we lose sight that the church isn't about the I, but is about the we. It's about the God that unites all of us into the church and gives us the gifts and resources we need. And like the church in Corinth, being a community of different people who do different things, believe different things, and have different backgrounds and experiences isn't easy. Paul says there's no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't mean our distinctions go away, or that to strive for unity, we need to strive for sameness. And that's good news. Unity in Christ and in the church is about putting what's distinctive about us, who we are and what we are, putting that into the church for the common good. One scholar calls church the lavish celebration of the communion of the different. It's our differences that make us strong and make it so the church can carry out its mission. It takes every sort of person and every sort of God-given gift. So as we look towards annual meeting and a new iteration of church leadership, I'd like to list some of the different gifts I've seen working together for the building up of this body. And we're going to be working off a list Paul has in Romans. So there's ministry, there's the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, though it seems like the Lord could have always blessed the church with a few more givers. There's the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness, but that's just a start. There's much more that Paul doesn't list. We have the handy for fixing things, the spry for carrying things, the wise for their wisdom, the patient for their patience and level-headedness, the visionaries for new ideas, the dependable for continuity, the coffee makers for coffee, the organized for organization, the funny for humor. I suppose we should thank the snow shovelers for clear walkways. <laughs> we have the bakers for pies, cakes, and cookies. We have the cooks for all the wonderful food we share together, musicians for music, and so on. But the greatest gift I've seen in this congregation is love. And that's good because Paul says that's the most important one. And it's through loving God and each other that we're knit together in the Holy Spirit. And I pray that as we look at the future together, that we always continue to live in faith, abound in hope, and grow all in love. Amen.
are there any joys people would like to lift up this morning? I'm definitely joyful people showed up, so I wasn't <laughs> preaching to the live stream alone. <laughs> So are we not then living witnesses to each other? Amen. 13 people, and we're living witnesses to what, what church is. We're small, but mighty. <laughs> so thank you for, for coming up and also for being witness to, uh, to each other and to anyone who's watching on stream. <laughs> Might be sick of it by then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Thanksgiving that your mom is feeling better. There will be plenty of coffee and plenty of donuts for all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can each bring your own box home even. <laughs> Are there any concerns people would like to lift up? Prayers for those affected by a mental illness and for the Shagru family. And continued pray prayers for the Red Ways and the Beans. All right. Let us enter a time of silent prayer. We lift up those prayers that we heard and those that are still on our hearts. God of all might and power, we praise you that you forged your church in the fire of the spirit and breathed life into your people that we might be the body of Christ. We thank you that you have called many saints before us who by your help and with the help of each other were able to do what they could not do alone. We thank you for bringing us together and for the ways you bless and sustain us. We thank you for friends, family, laughter, fellowship, and community. We thank you most of all that our Lord came to rescue us from sin and deliver us beyond the grave to a rebirth and newness of life. In the beginning, you created heaven and earth. In the fullness of time, you restored all things in Christ. Renew our world in this day with your grace and mercy. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and house the homeless. We pray for people who have been affected by natural disaster or inclement weather. 
and especially anyone affected by the recent storm and pray that people get to their destination safely. We ask that you renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase prejudices that oppress and guide us along your path of kindness and love. We pray for our enemies, that we may regard them with the reconciling love made manifest in Christ. You, O God, breathed life into the flesh you created. Now by your spirit, breathe new life into the children of earth. Turn hatred into love, sorrow into joy, and war into peace. You desire the unity of all Christians. Set aflame the whole church with the fire of your spirit. Unite us to stand in the world as a sign of your love. Guide us to use our varied gifts and experiences for the building up of your church and your kingdom. Through your spirit, you supply every human need. Heal the sick, comfort the distressed, bind up the brokenhearted, befriend the friendless, give peace to the dying, and help to the helpless. Your spirit restores our ancient spirits. In our labor, give us rest. In our temptation, strength. In our sadness, consolation. Wash away our sin and heal our wounded spirits. Kindle within us the fire of your love to burn away our apathy. With your warmth, bend our rigidity and guide our wandering feet until the last day when we with all your faithful saints will dwell together at the home in your eternal kingdom. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In thanksgiving for the God who is always at work among us and doing the unexpected wonderful things in the world, let us present with joy our offerings of commitment and support for the work of Christ Church. The morning offering will now be received.
please join me in the unison prayer of dedication. God of abundant love, we thank you for the gift of your spirit poured out on all who live in Christ. May these gifts be our response of abundant love. Use them and us to bless others. Through Christ our Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And as you go, may the grace and peace of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Amen.